to greet you all this morning in Jesus' precious name. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Our Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We just ask your blessing upon us. Lord, we thank you again for all that you do for us. Help us be faithful to you. Help us trust you. Fill us with your spirit and give us wisdom. Again, we just want to ask that you'd help us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, to begin 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, verse 10. It says, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for it is the day for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire." What I want to talk about this morning is uh, being tested. Uh, the struggle, the battle that we're in. This ver these verses here talk about that our foundation is on the Lord, but we all have an opportunity to build on that foundation. And it's not just an opportunity, it is our responsibility to build on that foundation. There is a possibility that of all the things that we do, the busyness, the, all of the things that we do in our life that we may think that are valuable will wind up being nothing but wood, hay, and stubble, and all be burned. This doesn't, some people use this to say, well, you can live however you want. And that means that we'll all be saved in the end, you know, because we've accepted Jesus or whatever. And so just my works will be burned up, and people take comfort in that. That's not what he's talking about. I'm talking about people, or he's talking about people that are actually following the Lord, but their focus or their, their attention becomes on external things that are to be seen of men and they may look right on the outside, but it'll all be burned up. They'll be of no value. Sometimes we think that, well, that, what does it matter? You know, if, if uh, just so I go to heaven, it doesn't really matter whether I have anything or not, or whether I've counted to anything or amounted to anything or not. And we have that attitude, well, that attitude is towards your foundation. That attitude strikes at your foundation. And so I, I remember hearing a man one time <clears throat> that he said in church, he said, 
I just want to get there by the skin of my teeth. I don't care about anything else. I just want to get, get to heaven. I don't care whether I have any rewards or works. Well, with that kind of an attitude or with that kind of a heart, that the very heart of that is selfish and not on the foundation of what Christ built in the first place. And I just, when he said that, he just I want to get there by the skin of my teeth. And I thought about that. You know, Paul thought that he was only going to get there by the skin of his teeth. But that wasn't his goal. His goal was to serve the Lord. And we so easily get our foundations or our desire on the goal instead of on what we're doing right now. That's laying the foundations that will prepare us that we will be accepted. In Revelation chapter 3, it says that those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door. No, that's wait a minute. Back up here to verse 14, it says, or 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white raiment so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. We think this verse, or this verse is used is so that you'll be saved. That's not what he's talking about. He's inviting the church. He's inviting those who know who he is. He's actually talking to the church at Lady, Lady Osea. But he's saying, I stand at the door and knock. And I tell you, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. These people thought they were. These people thought they had it all down pat. They thought they had everything in order. They thought that they could see. And he said, buy these things from me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But yet... You think you've got them all. You think you're there. You think you've got it all handled. You think you're rich. You think that you understand all these things. You think you know. But I'm telling you, you don't. I'm telling you, you're poor. I'm telling you, instead of being clothed properly, you're naked. Instead of being able to see, you're blind. And he's talking to people in the church here. It goes along with what we're doing will be tried by fire. We'll be tested. That's what this life is about. When we think that all the tests are going to be in the future, all the tests that are in the future, everything there will burn up if that's our idea. We think our test will be on the judgment day. Well, if our test don't come until then, there won't be anything left. This is our test. And if we have the attitude, we're rich, we're clothed, we've got it all down pat, we see. Then on the judgment day, everything will be wiped away. Everything will be wiped away. And here Jesus said, repent. He talked about repentance so, so that your name won't be blotted out. 
He who overcomes, I will grant to set down. Overcomes. Overcomes what? I went to church. It was a burden for me to go to church. Oh, it's so hard to get up on Sunday morning and go to church. Is that your, what you're overcoming? Are you overcoming? Oh, I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to, you know, it's so hard. Is that what we're overcoming? That's not what he's talking about. Gold that is worthy of the Lord is gold that's been tried in a fire. It's been tested. We've talked about it in Job, the verse where he, he, what we, the refiner's fire. They had put gold and they had melted it down into the fire and all the stuff that was impure would come over and form a scum on top of the gold that was boiling. And the guy would sweep off all of that and throw it away and then boil the fire more. And he'd come up and he'd have a scum over it again and he'd wipe it away throw it away, and he'd boil it some more. He'd do that until he would boil it, and what came to the top, he could see his own reflection in it again because it had to be purified, and that's us. And if our purification is, oh, it's just such a burden, to, do, to go through life and live these simple little things. There's not much scum coming to the top. We're not going through much fire. There won't be much left on the judgment day. Because if we wait till the judgment day for all the scum to be cleaned out of our lives, refined from our lives, we might just get thrown away with the scum because there wasn't enough gold there to even be worth saving at best. We put through the fire and God refines the gold. We think a big old pot full of gold, but actually it's probably just a little, little bitty thing that we think's gold and there won't be much true gold there. Real gold, real life requires struggle, temptations, overcoming, test. You know, we look at society today. I've looked at it and I see people that have no reason in the world to have any problems. And they're miserable. I mean, they've just had everything. It's right there in front of them, and they're miserable. And I, I think, why are you miserable? You've got everything you need. And it's just been given to you almost. And yet, you're miserable. And that's the reason why. For a person to properly mature, there has to be struggle in their lives. And when you take struggle out of a person's life, they don't mature properly. They don't grow up. They don't become an adult. A human being without struggle is a miserable existence. They're a spoiled child. They're a pampered child. And if they never go through that struggle, they never mature to become an adult. That's why there's so few men in the world today. That's why there's so few women in the world today whether they're 80 years old or 40 years old or 20 years old, 
they've never matured to becoming a man or a woman. I don't know how many times we've seen people that whenever they were 12 or 13 years old started taking drugs or drinking so they didn't have to face the struggles of life. Life was too hard for them. So they started taking these substitutes and bringing these substitutes into their life so they wouldn't have to face the struggle. The struggle that would actually help them mature and give them strength to face life. And so they take all these things on their lives. And then when they're 20 or 30 years old, sometimes they recognize that, hey, I'm ruining my life. And so they turn from those things. They turn to the Lord. The Lord delivers them. And so they pick up a Bible and they all of a sudden have all this knowledge. But they have the maturity of a 10 or a 12 year old person. There's not been a struggle. They've not become an adult. They haven't faced these hard things. They've just been delivered from bad things. And now they become experts. They become experts because they know how to read their Bible. And they go around teaching and preaching to everyone. And they've got the maturity level of a 10 or 12 year old person. That's what we see is going on today. People go to school and they're taught all of this knowledge and they learn how to do things with all of this knowledge. But they never learn how to do things. They're just taught how to do things. They go to college and they learn and they learn and they learn. You know, the thing they say about the generations, the younger generations, the age uh, millennials and that whatever they call them, is they know everything. That's what's said about them. Whenever you talk about it, they've got a new Monopoly game and it's, it just kind of pokes fun at them knowing everything. You can't tell them anything because they've learned in their head, but it hasn't cost them anything to learn it. They've never been through a struggle. They've had everything given to them. They've never had to go out and work to provide shelter for themselves, provide food for themselves. That's all been taken care of. They've been pampered. Any time that something would go wrong in their life, they were just showered with comfort so that everything's just handed to them. And then you pile knowledge on top of that, knowledge on top of no effort, no work, no struggle, no need to survive. And that's just the breeding ground for mental disease. It's the breeding ground for confusion. All puffed up for free. Didn't cost them nothing. Didn't learn anything. Don't know anything. They learn, but they don't know anything. All of this knowledge piled on them with no work, with no effort. And it's just a poisonous breeding ground for what we have today. And then someone comes along and gives them a participation trophy gives them a trophy just for showing up. Didn't take them no effort. They just 
receive the trophy. That's what Christianity is. You just show up, Jesus saves you, and everything's taken care of. You just get a participation trophy. The conservatives and the Christians scoff at the idea of someone going to a baseball game, coming in dead last, and getting a trophy for it. But then they go to church and expect that's what Jesus is going to do for them. It's all taken care of. The Bible says every man's work will be tried by fire. His effort will be tried by fire. If you want to follow the Lord and you're just looking for an easy path, everything to go smooth, you're just using Jesus as your meal ticket. When you come to follow the Lord, you come to follow the Lord and you see his cross and you take it up. You choose to enter a struggle, a battle where we have an enemy. You know, the Bible talks about God turning his back on a people, on a nation. The first step of God turning his back on a nation is giving them everything they want. That's where the Lord leaves. Because the devil isn't there to oppose and fight. He's getting his way. So he lets them build this big trap for themselves, this big snare for themselves. That's when the Lord leaves. We think the Lord leaves whenever all hell breaks loose and everything collapses. The Lord leaves whenever he lets them to their own devices. That's when the Lord's gone. Because the Lord rebukes and disciplines and chastens those that he loves. Because he knows what ease and comfort and all these things bring on us. He knows the poison it produces. He knows the trap and the snare that's behind it all. The Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 4. Verse 2, when virtue is present, people imitate it, and when it goes away, they long for it. Throughout one's lifetime, virtue leads the struggle for undefiled prizes, wearing a crown and conquering. But the prolific multitude of the ungodly are useful to no one and none of their illegitimate seedlings will grow a deep root or establish a sure footing. Virtue leads the struggle. There's a struggle that comes with virtue, a battle. This world looks at someone that's successful in whatever they're doing, and they all, all of a sudden become an expert. Someone that sings a song about a subject, he might not even wrote it. And the next thing you know, they're testifying before Congress about this subject like he was an expert. People play a role in a movie about a subject. 
and they're, they're in front of the TV whenever that subject comes up again and they're the expert. People who've never been through anything in their lives are the experts because they can talk about it. Because they can explain it. Because they can sing about it. Because they can perform. And they become the experts. The experts are the ones who've gone through it. The experts are the ones who failed. And failed. And failed. And failed. And learn a little bitty step when they fail and get right back up. The experts are the ones who've been tried and tested and broken. Not the one who just sails through everything. Not the one who just, everything just comes natural and easy to them. The expert is the one who learns how because they've failed. They've gone through things. Had everything taken away from them. That's what Jesus talks about when he says, buy of me gold in the fire. Buy of me gold. Let me give you vision. Let me control your life. That's what being a parent is all about. Most parenting is taking care of children about how I feel about them instead of what the child actually needs. We want a pamper. We want a baby. We want to be right there anytime they have a little bit of a problem. It's scoffed at today if, if someone isn't there for every little thing the child does. Like they don't care for the child or it's they're uh, cold and they can't love the child because they're not there at every little thing they do. That's spoiling the child. They're not going to get that much attention in the real world for every little thing they do. The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Do we want to really build something that will pass through test or are we just happy to grow what is above the ground easy skate through or are we willing to say Lord I want to buy some gold from you and then trust that what he puts us through is good for us. We don't want to trust the Lord that way. Everybody wants to be saved. Everybody wants things to go well. That's why the church is so popular today because promises of prosperity and things going well and that just we love that you start talking about 
things going bad or a hard time. Nobody wants that. We want churches to grow and prosper and have thousands and thousands of converts and just be successful all over. Growing here and there, everywhere. But if there's a devil, he's not going to be too interested in that. If it's real. We can go be all happy and all rah, rah, rah. All excited. But it don't last. We take ourselves too seriously. We think we're too important to have setbacks. We think we're too important to have failures. It's just not too cool to have problems. But the only person that moves forward is someone who fails. The only way to move forward is to fail. If we're just coasting along because we're too cool to fail, we are not going anywhere. We're going backwards. Our work will be tested either here or there. Problem is, if it fails there, we will lose. We will eventually lose. We can do it here or there. If we lose here, we can gain. If we lose there, we're lost. Lord, add his blessings.